That's all right. That's all right. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics here in the School of Medicine. And we're pleased to see all of you here today for a program titled The Public University and the Public's Health. This program focuses on the obligations that public institutions of higher learning have with respect to the communities in which they are embedded. In the case of public universities with academic health centers, that is hospitals and clinics, as well as schools preparing the next generation of health professionals, these institutions provide crucial health-related services to their public as a core part of their mission. Our University of Virginia mission statement aligns with the highest ideals for public education when it declares that the public institution of higher learning will serve the Commonwealth of Virginia, the nation, and the world. But UVA's contributions to the public health of our own community have not been in the service of all. We welcome today Professor Dana Bowen Matthew from UVA's Schools of Law and Medicine. She will discuss our university's public health legacy and its persisting consequences and will suggest ways that UVA might redress its impact on local public health and even thereby model a path forward for public universities across the nation. Dana Bowen Matthew is the William L. Matheson and Robert M. Morgenthau Distinguished Professor of Law, the F. Palmer Weber Research Professor of Civil Liberties and Human Rights, and Professor of Public Health Sciences in the Schools of Law and Medicine. You'll find a detailed bio sketch of Professor Matthew in your handout. Her work at the intersection of law, public health, and public policy, and in pursuit of more just and equitable health care for all, is making a difference here and across the United States. I'll quickly just also say that Professor Matthew had no financial conflicts of interest to declare. So please join me in welcoming Dana Bowen Matthew for a conversation that will close with conversation with you on the public health university, the public university and the public health. Welcome, Thank Dana. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I am a pacer. I'm hoping that's not going to drive anybody up there crazy. Um, but here in the medical center, you haven't left me much room for pacing. Um, and so there'll be a little bit of creativity on my mind uh, in, in this presentation. Thank you for having me. I, I know it's a little fraught to have a lawyer come over to the medical center, so I appreciate that you're not running from the room yet quite. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., and the reason I start by telling you that is because I counted a privilege to come down uh, the highway each day to work at the University of Virginia. I counted a privilege because it is a public university and I'm in the service of the public while I am here. As Marcia said, I have no conflicts to disclose, and I will quickly say that I do not believe I've ever worked for a university that was not a public institution because of the commitment to service. My purpose today will be to run through what I think we have done in practice that contradicts that lofty purpose. So I'll start by describing the purpose of public universities generally and our articulation of UVA's work in that space. I'll then contrast what we have done in practice which I think is quite contradictory, although ironically, it is because those who came before us understood their role in the public service, in public health, that what we've done is contradictory. And then I'll close by talking about what I and you might do in order to align our purpose with our practice. I don't know what I did already. Go forward. OK. So this is what we have stated. And I think we have a president, quite honestly, who is recentering the fact that being an institution of higher learning that is public is an institution that must be committed to serve. But if we spend some time examining what this service is to be, it's to be to the immediate local community, to the nation, to the commonwealth, and to the globe. I'm going to focus on the service of our public university and the local community. I think it's fraught. 
I think it's problematic. I think the ways in which we have taught talented students have not always been those from all walks of life. I think the ways that we have designed our curriculum to create responsible citizen leaders leaves room for improvement. But we're not the only one. Public education in general around the country, I think, is examining itself. It is in a period of introspection. The Carnegie Foundation said there is a growing chasm between the goals of higher education and the most disadvantaged, not only students, but the most disadvantaged among us. And that, the Carnegie Foundation described, as the social justice issue of our time, or one of them at least. At my former institution, the president, Drew Galpin Faust, was talking to a group of anchor institutions, examining what their purpose was. And I know this is hard to read, and word salad is not what you're supposed to put up. But because you're not going to have all of the slides if you stream this, let me look it, at this in some detail with you. Indeed, as other institutions falter in dispiriting succession, universities nurture the hopes of the world. Pause. On the way over, we had the opportunity in my cab to listen to the news about our government institution faltering here and abroad. So we know that she has set the stage properly. We are nurturing the hopes of the world in solving challenges that cross borders. We're unlocking new knowledge. We're building political understanding promoting dialogue and debate. We're showing a path forward. That is why I get on the highway every morning. That is why being at a public university is uniquely different. Our practice historically has been different in the public health space. What I want to talk about is how we can integrate our understanding of dehumanization, white supremacy, and the public health. That's the legacy that we have left. That's the legacy that we have created. So starting first with this word dehumanization, social psychologists have told us quite a lot about it. And I've spent some time looking at both blatant and subtle dehumanization. I've spent some time looking at the social psychology of a group calling itself an in-group, identifying others as an out-group, and making the decision, and this is the essence of dehumanization, that the out-group lacks human qualities, lacks human needs, lacks human values. Well, sadly, our institution's founder laid a foundation for us to dehumanize African Americans, women, Native Americans. If you've not read notes on the state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson said quite a lot about how blacks were like orangutans, how our griefs were transient. That turned out to be very important because he was reflecting what is baked into the legal tradition of our nation, in fact. So by a show of hands, how many of you know, this is not a law school class, but how many of you know what the 13th Amendment generally accomplishes? It generally does what? Please call it out. It ends slavery, right? However, if you take my constitutional law class, I have to show you that the language of our 13th Amendment, in fact, is quite different from the originally drafted 13th Amendment, which I'm showing on the screen. The originally drafted 13th Amendment did the exact opposite. It didn't end slavery. In fact, it created an unamendable amendment that would have institutionalized slavery. The emboldened language shows this to be true. Now, this would be a historical anecdote, if but not for the fact that this original language, which would have done the opposite of what we understand the current and enduring 13th Amendment, was an amendment that passed with the requisite two-thirds vote from the House of Representatives. It passed with the requisite two-thirds vote 
from the Senate. In 1860, it went on to the ratification uh, process, and six states, including Virginia, ratified this version that would have not ended, but institutionalized slavery. Now let me add to that that President Lincoln spoke with approbation about this amendment, this version of the amendment in his second inaugural address. And the only reason we don't know the end of the story, I'm not guaranteeing that this would have in fact been our constitutional fate, but the only reason we don't know is because we fired on Fort Sumter and the Civil War began. So my point in showing you this is to reiterate, to underscore, to emphasize the fact that deeply embedded, at least within our legal tradition, right, at least within the founding documents that created our nation was a race problem. I recommend to you the speech that Frederick Douglass made by that title, and that's all I ask you to consider with respect to dehumanization. In a legal class, I would spend time talking about the other four parts of the Constitution that expressly dehumanize African Americans. Let me, however, move on to the second of three prongs of what I think are the contradictory practice that contest and defy our role as a public university. White supremacy. So white supremacy is a little bit harder to wrap our heads around because the first articulation of it appears to come up sometime around 1892. Again, I'm a lawyer, so I can find this doctrine, this principle that one race, the so-called white race, is superior in a hierarchical way to all other races throughout replete in the legal documents. I can find them in court decisions, legislative histories. I can find them in uh, some of the ordinances that I'm going to show you later, even local ones. This notion that one race is supreme, others are inferior, one race is dominant, others are subordinate, is white supremacy. It is a version of white nationalism, which combined with white supremacy says not only is one race superior, but the country belongs to that one race. Right? White supremacy is a version of the doctrine of white nationalism, as I've said, but it's built on dehumanization. Right? It's built on the underlying devaluation of a human group as less than human, of another group of people as not worthy of or needing humanity. So, of course, familiarly, we saw this in August of 2017, let me say as an aside, I was scheduled to move to Charlottesville on August the 11th, 10th, excuse me, 2017. And in some talks, I start with the picture of my moving truck because it was all loaded, ready to come down to Charlottesville, and my moving truck driver came to me and said, we can't get into Charlottesville. Why? This was happening, right? So again, as an aside, this is off script, I will say to you, I feel somewhat like I'm in Selma in the 60s, right? This is ground zero for the kind of work that I do. But returning to the white supremacists that we see on the screen, I will tell you that when I arrived on the 14th, because that was the first day that my moving truck could get us into Charlottesville, the 14th of uh, August 2017, my excellent colleagues at the University of Virginia Law School said to me, Thank God you're here, and thank God they are gone. They were referring to these people on the screen, right? Now, the people on my left, your right, with the pointy hats and the guy that spells the Bible B-I-B-I-E-L, right? He's easy for us to pick out of a crowd. But I will tell you that I was scared that the people on my right, your left, were in my classroom. And I wasn't at all confident that they had indeed left. And in fact, as I've gotten to know the community here in Charlottesville, with the work of the Equity Center, which I'll tell you about at the end of my talk, the community does not believe that they ever left, does not believe that it was surprising that this happened, and in fact feels that we should not have been surprised either. White supremacy is not unique to the Charlottesville area. It is, in fact, and there are some very good articles that were published at the time, it is, in fact, in the view of many, and I've begun to share that view, 
unfortunately a part of our legal legacy and deeply embedded throughout the United States. If you ask, as the Pew Research Center did, Americans in 2018 whether they believe that the legacy of slavery persists, a majority of both black and white, sadly not Latinx, they weren't asked, but a majority of black and white, not Asians, they weren't asked, still feel as though slavery has an influence on the position and lives of African Americans in the United States today. So I'm not asking you to agree with it or disagree with it. I'm just explaining to you that the past is not even past. The past is not dead. And with respect to these doctrines, these principles of dehumanization and white supremacy, it lives on, as many agree, by survey in the United States re recently. So let's talk about public health in Charlottesville in the past, and then let me connect it to public health in Charlottesville in the present. The way I'm going to do this is by looking at a series of maps that are snapshots of the physical space in Charlottesville in the 1900s, the 1920s, and currently. The Sanborn maps, has anybody heard of the Sanborn maps? It's a series of maps that tell us a great deal about the physical buildings, the resources that are allocated, the ways in which communities organized themselves and gave access to the social determinants of health. The one I'm showing now was taken or drawn in 1907. And I'll just tell you a couple of things about the Sanborn maps. They have a lot of information. For those of you who are architects or engineers or cartographers, you have a lot more knowledge. But let me tell you what I'm drawing out of these maps, a couple of things. The color coding will tell us what materials buildings were made of. So yellow, frame wood materials. Pink, brick, masonry, concrete materials, right? One stronger, more enduring than the other. And you can see even just looking at the sort of spatial organization and distribution, right? Secondly, I'm looking at the allocation of resources that are necessary for humans to live. Water, electricity, sanitation. The Sanborn maps will tell us something about that as well. And thirdly, I'm looking at the density of population in residential areas comparing one to another. The Sanborn maps will tell us something about that as well. So I've located Union Station on the map of 1907 so that you can see as we progress from one map to another where these neighborhoods actually were as they evolved. So soon after 1907, the Charlottesville City Council swung into action, in my view, to operationalize dehumanization and white supremacy through law. It passed the 1912 segregation ordinance unanimously, and that ordinance began to organize the living spaces of blacks and whites in Charlottesville, beginning immediately after the first map that I just showed you. So let's look at this ordinance for a second. It shall be unlawful for any white person to move into and thereafter occupy as a residence or place of abode any house building structure or any part of any house building or structure, blah, 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 that are occupied as residences by colored people, more colored people than are occupied as residences by white people. Who thinks of this stuff, right? How do you actually legislate movement of people by race? This is how. Paragraph two. That it shall be unlawful for any colored person to move into or thereafter occupy as a residence or place of abode any house building or structure, any part of a house building or structure, or any alley, wherein a greater number of houses are occupied as residents by white people than are occupied as residents by coloreds. Now, I've given you two of 12, 13 paragraphs. It goes on and on. So that if a multi-unit dwelling was at issue, we got to tell by legislation how many of one versus the other could live there. 
unanimously passed in order to organize space or racialize space so that people were not allowed to live next door. Now, if you look at this ordinance, along with the oral history of what was going on in Charlottesville at the same time, ironically, and there's only one that really sticks out in my mind, but there exist more, there are interviews at the Albemarle Historical Society where people will say, all of a sudden, white folks started moving out. All of a sudden, people started moving around. And what that tells you actually aligns with the historical record, and that was that segregation had to be invented, right? We had to create a series of laws that organized people by race because on their own they had not done that. On their own, people just lived where they lived. But by 1920, the map that I'm showing now that little circular thing that looks kind of like a backwards or deformed Pac-Man identifies the greater concentration of African Americans in Charlottesville in the short period of time from 1912 to 1920. It did not take long. Not only did it not take long to organize and concentrate people, here's the public health message that I'd like you to really ponder. It didn't take long to discriminatorily distribute resources to each population based on race. So actually, thanks to you, Denise, I did a comparison of the maps of woolen mills, which is on my left, your right, and of Star Hill on my right, your left, in 1920, and this is what I take from this comparison. One, the residential density of housing is far greater in the black neighborhood than it is in the white neighborhood. Two, the proximity of recreational space, the river, later McIntyre Park, which was inaccessible to blacks in 19. 20, 21, 22, when it was first built. I think I have the, I don't have the date, but it was inaccessible to blacks, was accessible and proximate to whites. That's number two. Number three, and perhaps most disturbing of all that I see on this map, water lines, which are more difficult for you to see from a distance, but if you study these maps, course through the residential areas of white neighborhood woolen mills but not a black neighborhood, Star Hill. Why? Water went to the commercial properties, the businesses, but not to the homes. And lest for a moment we think that was not intentional, we can look at the city council records and we can see that neighborhoods, Kellytown was the name of Star Hill at the time, asked for municipal water and didn't get it. We can see that the city council would make this decision. It wasn't financially prudent when it was asked. This is true with electricity. This is true with transportation. I haven't found records on sanitation yet, but I think I will. Dehumanization assumes that a population is other than human and does not have the same needs, the same consciousness. It assumes it does not feel love and grief. It assumes it's not relying on the same things that others who are human need. That's what I think is happening on this map from a public health perspective. If I look at the next and the next map of Charlottesville, what you see, again, is that William Faulkner was right. The past is not dead. It's not even the past. Because on this map, which is taken in 2018, the concentration of African Americans around the Union Station core that I've shown on each of those maps endures to this day. If we look at the health of that population, that's where the public health 
crises exist today. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. But I cannot help but think that there is an association between the historical deprivation that disproportionately affected this community in 1912, 13, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 to today. And I think that is the public health legacy that we, the University of Virginia, are partially accountable for. So remember I said that in the beginning I counted a privilege to come here because I feel I serve the public. I feel that we serve the public. I think that we are doing this lofty, inspirational work that is it's, it's, it's nearly a calling. This was also true for the eugenicists that worked at the University of Virginia during 1910, 20, 30. I'm showing one. There are many if you're interested in their history. I recommend to you the book by Gregory Doerr called Segregation's Science. At the time of the University of Virginia was leading the public health department in Charlottesville, the segregation orders were being fueled by dehumanizing theories of white supremacy espoused by many, including Dr. Barringer. What we did then did evil, I'm suggesting that we can do good today. If we take as seriously as Dr. Berenger did, his responsibility to propose a tripartite solution of political disenfranchisement, transferring responsibility for African American education from blacks to whites so that they could learn to be law abiding, abiding laborers and artisans. He wanted to humanize the American population by eliminating the subhuman African American population. And that is why I suggest that we still have health gaps that demonstrate, that evince those unfair deprivations that I've shown you historically. Now, I don't have all the data I need to look at these health gaps. So when it comes to the part of the conversation where I say, here's what you can do, one of the things you can do is help me get the rest of this data. Right? It's really, really, really hard to get data out of the University of Virginia Hospital. Help me, please. <laughs> so we know that infant mortality gaps, I can tell you about them from 1935 to 1948. I can tell you about them then starting again in 1995 going forward. We know that nationally, Black mothers lose their babies on average about two and a half times as frequently as white women do in their first year of life. That's true here in Charlottesville, Virginia as well. Even though the absolute number or incidence of infant mortality has declined over these years, sadly, the gap between blacks and whites is very close today as to what it was in 1850 before the Civil War. Right? So that disparity still exists. It exists also for all-cause mortality rates. And here's the thing. I could go on and on about the health gaps between African Americans and whites. I can't do it as conclusively about the Latinx population and whites. That's another thing you can help me with. We could get better data. And we could publish it so that community leaders could use it. Because the public health problems that exist in Charlottesville today need our resources, need the resources of an R1 university, and they need them to solve the problems in a new way. What's that new way? So I'm showing here in order to answer that question, what is the new way that public health should be solving the problems that I'm describing in Charlottesville today? Oh, OK, that happened without me doing it. I want to be on the plane picture there. I'm putting this down. It's poltergeist if it changes again. So this is Flight 1549, the movie Sully, Sully was made about it. Does everybody know this movie? OK, so um, this flight had 155 souls on board. It's January. They hit a gaggle of geese when engine goes out. And Sully is the hero because he 
puts the plane down in the Hudson River in January. It's freezing in the Hudson River in January. Not conditions conducive to life, right? But pause for a minute looking at even this fuzzy photo. Do you see what I see? There are two separate groups of people on this plane. Do you see what I see? Right. So the small group of people is in the front. Small in number, that is. And the large group of people is on the wing of the plane that is going down, right? The large group of people is standing, their toes are getting wet, soon their ankles will get wet, and if they are not rescued, we know that they were, they will die in the Hudson River. The large group of people do not have the resources that the small group of people in front have. The small group of people in the front have a life jacket on, they have a life raft. They have little rations in their raft so that they don't have to eat each other as quickly as the other people will have to eat each other. They are in a better life position. Their life chances are better. Why? Because of where they were sitting on the plane. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that everybody has to sit in first class. Everybody doesn't get linen napkins and a drink before takeoff. That's not my concern. My concern is that all 155 souls should get off the plane. That's the public health and public health purpose that I think a public university should be dedicated to. Our resources should be invested in helping a community to accomplish. So for those of you in public health, this is a very familiar graft. I'm not doing it. This is a very familiar graph. Its only message is to convey that if we are to do public health a different way, if we are to make sure that place matters is at the core of our policies, of our interventions, of the work that we're going to do, we have to recognize that 40%, an estimated 40% of the determinants of health are social and physical and economic environmental factors. Even though we have a world-class health system here, we offer about 10% of the solution through it. And my suggestion is that if we're going to do public health differently today, we've got to take into account and be cognizant of this graph. So what is happening in those spaces, in the social determinants of health spaces in Charlottesville today? So one of the reasons I'm excited to come down the road is because I get to do this public purpose. Another reason is because we are a foodie town. We have great restaurants here. But indeed, even though we have these wonderful restaurants, we also have about 15.8% of our population that is food insecure. In fact, even though we have a world-class university hospital with world-class healthcare and world-class doctors, we still have that infant mortality gap that I was describing earlier. I can't figure out what the maternal mortality gap is. I think it's pretty bad, but because we define it so oddly at the Virginia Department of Health, Denise, I can't really tell what the gap is, but around the country it's three and a half times between a black and a white mother. I doubt it's different here. When we look at the social determinants of health from the youth perspective here in Charlottesville, a black youth is about two, maybe 2.3, I'm not changing it, about 2.3 times more frequently, I gotta talk fast it sounds like, in order as, as likely to get arrested, be on probation, or be in jail as a white youth. I'm just checking to see if it's advancing on me. African-Americans are five times more likely to be arrested in Charlottesville than whites. Is that because they are five times more likely to engage in criminal behavior? The data does not suggest that is true. In fact, this national, this is not Charlottesville data, this national d data is worth a pause, right? Because I come from Colorado, I know a lot about marijuana, right? Not firsthand, I just know a lot about marijuana, right? This is data that shows on the left side, between 2001 and 2014, the difference between the prevalence of use of marijuana between blacks and whites, right? Dark and light bars are virtually identical. And in fact, that's 2014. 
Now those bars are almost exactly the same height. But look at the graph on the other side. The arrest rate for violating marijuana laws, use, possession of paraphernalia, driving under the influence. Look how wildly disparate the white arrest rate is as compared to the African-American arrest rate. This is more likely the story that explains the five times difference between blacks and whites being arrested so disproportionately in Charlottesville. That is a social determinant of health. And we could spend a good deal of time unpacking why, but I'm going to tell you one personal story that explains why it's a mental health concern. I'm the mother of three black children. One of them is male. Everybody who is a parent here has the same level of anxiety associated with your 16-year-old going out to drive for the first time. All of us have been afraid that their frontal lobe gap is going to cause them to be upside down in a ditch. And we're all stressed until they get home. I have an additional stress that my 16, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old boy is going to run into a police officer who means him no initial harm, but associates him immediately with criminality and is going to be afraid of my child and defend his or her life by killing my child. I'm afraid for that every single day. I'm afraid that my child's future is going to look like this. And that's a stress. It is a toxic level stress that moms in Charlottesville and moms around the country are experiencing. What's the effect on the kids? Well, I am sorry to tell you that in Charlottesville, Virginia, despite the fact that we have the Curry School of Education, because we are a flagship university, even though those things are true, we rank, according to SEPA, among the 20 lowest districts for a black-white gap in educational achievement. Right? And the problem is not because of the kids alone. The problem is because of the system that we have built around them. The problem is a public health problem that we at the University of Virginia could help to solve. Housing costs will, if they exceed 30% of your income, influence what you purchase for your kids to eat. It will influence how much you spend on their educational enrichment. It will influence your health. Social mobility in Charlottesville among the poor, black, white, or otherwise, ranks in the 34th percentile of 2,400 states. I don't know what's happening, I'm sorry. 2,400 states, or counties rather, that were investigated recently in a 2018 report. And I will go on and on. All of the social determinants of health, gaps in household income, in unemployment, Gaps in high school graduation, these are all manifestations of the inequalities I suggest that we saw historically, and they all present public health problems. Now the question, what can we do about them? That's the elephant in the room. I'm going to suggest to you that we at the University of Virginia, because we are a public institution, have a moral, an ethical, and an intellectual obligation to bring our resources to bear on the series of problems that I've just described. In fact, that is why we are created. That's why we exist. And so the part that I'll tell you about in closing is the Equity Center. We've just founded it. It will launch in November of 2019. This is a shameless invitation and promotion for anybody in this room to join us in the work of bringing the resources of the University of Virginia to bear on the local inequities. We are resource rich, not only financially as this slide suggests, but the intellectual brain power, problem solving power, invention, innovation, 
the things that we know, the things that we can examine and create, the solutions that we can create are exactly what are needed for what, remember, are the social issues of our time, the grand challenges of matching the public university's purpose to serve and the need of the surrounding environment. Not only are we responsible to do it because that's what a public university does, but we built our greatness on the inequity that now surrounds us. Now, thankfully, our president walked in and in about 50 days did the work of paying a living wage, which I think is a public health gesture. I think that'll actually improve the public health more than much of what I have been doing with my career, um, just with that simple gesture. But if we want to prove, improve the public health, what we have to remember is that in Charlottesville, here at the University of Virginia, this is where I would have been born if I had been born here. This is the Negro Ward. This is in the basement. This is in the recent and current memory of many of the African Americans who live in our community. That is why they don't come here. That is why they don't comply. That is why they don't trust us. They remember that this is where their children were born. They remember that this is also where the veterinary ward was, the basement of the hospital. They remember that these nurses were not allowed to graduate when they were here. But they also know that in April, we redressed that. By finding the hidden nurses, and I understand there's a Filipino hidden nurse project as well. By finding those nurses, by graduating them, by renaming Penn Hall, don't think for a minute that these are trivial gestures. They are non-trivial indeed. I'm suggesting that we must do more, however. William Faulkner was here in Requiem of a Nun. He said the past is not dead. The past is not even past. African Americans in this community were deprived the social determinants of health, or at least equal access to water, to electricity, to sanitation, to the right to vote, to building materials, to recreational spaces. They were done, this was done to them by law. We are not the only community facing these problems. I'll speed through two other communities that are doing things we have yet to explore here. North Carolina, Louisiana, they're using their Medicaid dollars to blend and braid them, to not just refer people out to social services, but to recognize that if people don't have housing first, they're not going to comply with medications, with mental health interventions. They're using the agencies that are up until now operating in silos in Louisiana to create supportive housing where the housing department works with the public health department, works with the education department, works with all of the needs of adults to have living wages and jobs. This is public health. And why is it public health? Well, in part it's public health because one, we have the data that evinces the impact of inequality. Two, we have a population perspective, not an individual retail versus wholesale is the way I say it to my students, not an individual healthcare needs. We see the shape of problems as they develop, as we saw them in the maps, right? Three, we have a preventive orientation, right? We don't wait until the patient falls off of the cliff, is brought in an ambulance, and we try to put this together ex post. Indeed, preventive population perspectives allow us to act on data in a comprehensive, holistic way. I'm going to submit to you that there's no better people, no better group than medical and public health perspective-oriented folks 
who will begin to address these inequities that I've talked about. So the Equity Center is going to have five initiatives. They're listed here on the board. I'm going to go through this slide really fast because what I really want you to do is see your role, figure out how big a deal you can make, and then bring it to us. We need your help in solving these problems. Dr. Mona was the first call that my senator, I was working on Capitol Hill at the time of the lead crisis in Flint, Michigan. That was the first call that Senator Stabenow's health policy team made when the lead water crisis was declared. First call. You guys don't realize the power that you have the influence that you had. My job, I was basically a glorified intern. I'm talking now off script. I was a glorified intern on Capitol Hill working for Senator Stabenow in Michigan, right? In January of the year, 2018, that the crisis was declared, right? That January, I had the privilege of doing basically what are called citizen calls. Frankly, America's a pretty amazing country. If you want to walk in and talk to the people who have the power to do something about a problem that you see, what you do is you knock on the door, you walk in and you say, I live in your state, I want 15 minutes of your time, and you get it. If you are a health professional, you get unlimited time. That was my charge. Doctor, nurse, physician assistants walks in, you listen to whatever they have to say, because they can help us. That's the kind of influence you have. How did we figure out about vaping? Wisconsin doctors did it. I submit to you that if I had another hour, I could convince you that the only reason we have a Civil Rights Act of 1964 in this country is because of physicians. That's how we got civil rights law. Now, I'm not saying you all have to go to Washington, DC. But please come on October 31st to the Equity Center's open house. We're going to talk to faculty members about how we can do community-engaged research in a way that will actually put resources back into the community. These are the things we want to do. These are the events that we're going to have. In order to fulfill what I think is a grand purpose of not only being a great university, but also being a good one, I really think the time is now, and we could do this. So thanks for listening, and I'll take a few questions. Thank you so much. And we do have uh, time for some questions. We have a couple of handheld mics. And please identify yourself when you ask your question. Sure. Hi, my name's Amaya, and I'm a fourth year medical student in the School of Medicine. Um, so I was particularly interested in the piece that you had about the criminal justice system and inequalities in the criminal justice system. And I would say for those of you that haven't had a chance to watch um, When They See Us, Ava DuVernay's um, documentary about the exonerated five, I would highly recommend it as I think it humanizes a lot of the inequalities that we see in the criminal justice system. Um, one of the, um, so one of the projects that I was potentially interested in would be creating an education program for youth yep. within um, low-income minority school districts in particular to educate folks about the criminal justice system. And I was wondering, um, as a lawyer, as someone who works here in Charlottesville and as someone who works in DC, whether that's something that you've seen put into practice yet or not. So um, first of all, make sure I get connected with you. Um, one of the five initiatives of the Equity Center is to create um, spaces for youth pipeline work because we have all of these educational resources here. When we ask the community what is the thing that they need from us, they need to feel as though they are available to them, right? Everybody doesn't have to come to UVA. So first thing we're doing in that initiative is a scan of all of the youth pipeline organizations that are going on. So in answer to your question, yes, the Boys and Girls Club has one. The city of Charlottesville School is about to create something um, that's modeled after the University of Michigan's Pathways program. Um, there are, um, there's a group called Candid that does after school work, but it's very fragmented right now, right? So the American Pastors Council, African American Pastors Council is doing SAT prep. That's a pipeline program. But they are doing it. How many of you have kids that have applied to have gone in college, right? Did they study for two days for the SAT or more? More. So they're doing a two-day prep, 
right? That's the best that they can do by themselves. It's our job to help them do better. It's our job. So yes is the answer, but there's a long way to go, and that's what I think UVA can do. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Kristen. I work in um, the School of Medicine and Research. We've connected by email about interest, um, my interest in like, the Latinx population, and just kind of what I thought of spontaneously was um, your comment about toxic stress mm. among mothers of color. And I, I correlate that, and I can um, draw parallels to Latina mothers in the community who are undocumented and mm -hmm. um, kind of just living with that fear. And also what UVA just did in terms of collections and um, wanting to disseminate words. So I work with uh, persons of HIV and uh, worried about these $4,000 bills that are going to their homes. So thinking about how can we make sure that the patients who are served here who even they're undocumented, um, kind of that message reaches them yeah. and they're aware of like the new policies that are being. I think there are a couple of ways and I'm gonna answer your question but I wanna say this generally. I don't have all the answers. I think you have the answers we need. I'm asking you to think as I'm thinking philosophically, orient yourself to taking what we have as our mission of innovation and discovery and turning it on a service lens, right? So I'm gonna tell you some of the answers, but I think you have more answers than I do, right? I don't presume to have all the answers. A couple of things. One, when I was in Colorado, we had a large Latinx community that we served in medical legal partnerships. And the medical legal partnerships absolutely were overrun with work as the current administration's immigration policies started to change. Children wouldn't go to sleep. They were crying in school. Parents didn't have a plan for a very real threat of separation from their families. And so what we did from the university perspective is we developed a Know Your Rights team and toolkit so that we went into neighborhoods and we said, you need a power of attorney, you need to tell your children what to do if you're rounded up, you need to know the numbers to call, and we gave them tools to relieve the stress. Now, did we ex get rid of it? No. But one of the things we did was give families a way to manage the uncertainty with facts. This is what can happen to you. Here's how you can prevent it. That's one thing, because we're legal experts. We could bring that to the community. Right? There's other stuff that we could do, because toxic stress, I would imagine in Latinx communities, has not to do just with whether you are or are not undocumented. We are talking about something that's affectionately called the Hispanic paradox. I think that has to do with stress generally of living in the United States where you are othered as opposed to appreciated, right? So what we can do has to do with nutrition, it has to do with information, it has to do with pipeline programs, it has to do with lots of other stuff that the community will tell us when we say, what is actually stressing you out? What do you need? Um, Dana, I'm Dr. Greg Gelbert, and um, I used to teach your children in church in Sunday school. Ha. Ha. How um, are you? Good. I, uh, I felt like I was listening to a prophet, and if we had been back in our church in the 90s, I would have been saying amen quite a bit. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you for um, allowing yourself to be taken to this place where you're at now. Uh, on a personal note, I think that um, you carry a lot of burden because I see what you're saying as being somewhat prophetic, and that's not an easy role to play in this culture or anywhere. Secondly, as a person who teaches medical students, I have to say, however, that I feel like if you got the nursing school involved a lot, yes. that your program, which I admire, would be more effective, mm. because I personally have found that the nursing school is far more involved with their feet on the ground in the health care of this community than the medical school. We tend to have our students, the medical students here in the university, mm -hmm. and not so much out in mm -hmm. the community, except mm -hmm. in places like my office where they are students mm -hmm. learning. But in general, I feel like the nursing school has it made. I mean, they're, they're just more effective. I'm gonna take that advice to heart. Um, 
I will say that one of our core leadership uh, leaders is Susan Cools. I will also say that we exist because Christine Kennedy had the courage to advocate for us in rooms we couldn't go into, so yes. And amen. <laughs> do we have time for one more question? We do. We do, because we started a little late. Hello, my name is Sam Shields, and I'm a chaplain here at UVA. And I was wondering, um, when you showed the Sanborn maps, um, the, the, the part on water was really intriguing to me. I studied water rights in undergrad in my Christian education um, program. And uh, religion also belongs to like the basic World Health Organization, along with sanitation and location, all of the things that you mentioned. And I was wondering, along those commercial lines, were historically mm. black communities or historically black churches denied um, access to water within their facilities? I don't know if you saw that in the maps or in the legislation, but I was wondering if you had maybe come across that. So I don't know the answer to the question, but boy, oh boy, are my synapses firing at this point. I would love it a chance to talk to you some more. Um, I can tell you that we see, uh, not in the Star Hill map, but in the area downtown near uh, a blow up of near Union Station, um, a number of black churches in the 1920 map, the 1937 map, and of course the 1959 map, like a number of them. I didn't look to see if water was going there, and I certainly can't find yet any city council records that say the church itself asked for uh, access to public or municipal pipes. Um, but I'm, I, I, so the answer is I don't know yet. Um, I want to go on, though, to say that I didn't put up the data. We just found the data from the HEAR Water Equality Study, which is quickly something the Equity Center did as a pilot this summer in order to look at the quality of water uh, in communities that are served by public water, municipal water sources, versus communities that are served by private wells and other private sources, right? No surprise, the communities that have public access are predominantly white, Scottsville. The communities that have private well access are predominantly black. We hoped to get 50 families to return their kits. We had almost 200 return their kits, water testing quit, kits. We sent them to Virginia Tech. It is not a scientific study. It was a pilot to see if our hypothesis was worth testing, and it was because we found E. coli, chloroform, lead exceedances significantly in the black, privately served communities and not in the white, publicly served communities. Pilot study, all kinds of problems with using that data as definitive. We're gonna go get some more money and finish the study. But the past is not past if what's in that pilot data is still true. So we're at the end of an hour, but clearly there is work to be done. Um, also, it, um, it may not have been um, something that Dana was aware of, but this talk today is a wonderful introduction to what we're going to be talking about next week, which are the Jackson P. Burley High School's Segregated Black Practical Nurse, Licensed Practical Nursing Program. And those graduates who you saw in one of her slides, um, who are now UVA alumni, uh, as of last spring, thanks to the nursing school and President Ryan. Um, Victoria Tucker and Barbara Manwall from the School of Nursing will be with us, as will Evelyn Gardner and Clarice Coles Harris, two graduates of that LPN program in the late 50s, early 60s. Those nurses were trained here to work in the black in the segregated wards in the days before the hospital was integrated. Um, so we invite you to come back next week, and I think, you know, we'll certainly build on, uh, in many ways, on uh, the talk and the challenges that Dana Matthew has brought uh, to us today. And we'll see our community in new ways, and I hope with, um, with new inspiration. There are also ways in which the past is having a door shut on it, and one thing was it was nice to see Dr. Berenger up there because his name is no longer on a building, uh, actually the building where our center 
lives, which is now being renamed for NIH director Francis Collins. But thank you, Dana, Bo, and Matthew, and thank all of you for being here. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.